Follow what you want to make cool money. Bullet. Ninga, show money. Bullet. Ella. In my name, my name is in full. The pagan. Beba, ente, beba. The principle is about uh, environment for sustainable development. And this is really... It's not about people's land rights. It, 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 it's all about that. And it, again, this is about sustainable development. It's about rights. It's about land. It's about all of that. And I want to talk to the company, and I hope you will record this one. It's not about human rights being violated. It's a process of consultation which was not done properly. There has been no decision by this community um, to approve mining on their land. And in, in that respect too, um, the Department of Minerals and Energy is in violation of, of, of law that was enacted for the protection of uh, people who live on communal land. Good morning, Chief Justice. Good morning, Commissioners. Are you well? Yes, I'm nervous, but I'm well. Thank you for asking. So I decided rather than focusing on the obvious one, the right to vote, I had decided to, to focus on, on socio-economic rights because I feel very strongly about attaining social justice in our society, and that is why I chose the, the PAC. You also joined the yes, PAC? absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, joined, I joined the PAC uh, in the late 80s and the early 90s. Yes. And those were very informative years. Those years informed my political conscience and it shaped my political conscience. Yes. As a matter of fact, in those years, many, of, uh, many political secret meetings took place in my house. The whole Dakar excursion was, yes. was, was, was planned in my, in my house. I was drawn to the PAC in those days, and, and if, if you ask me why, I don't mind telling you why, but, but, but just stating that I was drawn to the policies. And I, as a matter of fact, I was drawn to the philosophy of non-racialism. Yes. And I can remember when I read a book of Robert Sabuk where he said there's only one race and that's a human race, that's a human and race. I was drawn yes. to that. Yes. So, I can say, because I wasn't a judge at the time, I voted for the PAC in the first yes. election. Well, in your own words, uh, tell us why you believe you deserve to be appointed. I believe that I have many years of practical, practical experience spanning back to the early eight or the late 80s. I believe that my academic background can assist me in dealing with very complex matters, because one has to remember that when you deal with constitutional matters, sometimes it's not per se a constitutional matter. You have to be au okay fait with all the branches of the law. I do feel that I can make a contribution. I felt comfortable at the, at the constitutional court. I was very conscious of the fact that this is the apex court, that it is an immense responsibility, and that your judgments have a far-reaching effect, but I, but I do believe that I have a role to play, and I do believe, as a member of society, that I can contribute to the jurisprudence of, of our judiciary. What do you think are the challenges facing constitutionalism transformation in our country, or transformation is? Well, as we know, and we're painfully aware of the fact that our constitution constitutes a bridge between the past, a horrific past, and an, inc an unequal past, and the present. As I read the current position at the moment, I think the land issue is, for me, the most challenging issue that we will have to deal with in our courts, and it might also be dealt with on a constitutional level. Are you a judicial activist or are you, are you conservative in your approach to judicial jurisprudence? I have no hesitation to say that I'm an activist. I have been an activist in my early years. I can't say that I have contributed to the struggle in the same way that my other brothers and sisters have. I haven't walked in their shoes. So I can't proclaim that my role was that active. But in those days, I did play my little role in order to 
in order to ensure that we have social transformation in our society. One of my biggest aims, or one of my focus as a lecturer was to empower women in the workplace. It ended up much broader than that, empowering women in the general sense in order to assist them to have access to justice. So I will definitely characterize myself as an activist and definitely not as conservative. Are you able to quote a judgment where that judicial activism comes through? I can probably um, quote a few, but I think the most recent one is the judgment in Baleni, the Tolobeni community, where um, I was faced with a very difficult question, how to balance the, the balance two acts. Both acts are aimed at transforming the mining industry and both acts, not, not the mining industry, both acts are focused at transforming our society. And I believe in, 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 in that act, uh, in, 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 in that judgment, I have demonstrated that I'm sensitive to the needs of our country and sensitive to the needs and the plight of our fellow citizens and the fact that there is still a lot of exploitation of minority groups and also the marginalized groups in this country. When you were making your judgment on the Baleni um, and others, you, your opinion was that the uh, customary communities tend to be disproportionately suffer from the impact of, of mining activities. Would you care to elaborate, please? Um, a little bit of background. This community has been living on this particular area um, that's on the west coast. It's, it's a coastal area. It's a beautiful coastal area. They have been living there for many, many years. Now, from I have been informed um, by academic papers that have been placed before me that this is, a, this is a very closely knit community. They follow traditions that have been passed on to them over many, many years. They have a very strong link, strong link with the land on which they live. The ancestors have lived there, the ancestors are buried there. The link between that community and the land is extremely strong. What happened in that particular case is that a mining right was um, gr uh, granted in favor of a mining house, and that would have resulted in mining activities on their ground. And I do recall when I read, and, 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 and the reports are very comprehensive, how that would have impacted on, on their way of life. Now, way of life encompasses many things. It's how you interact with one another, how the community work together, how the community pull together their resources. For example, when there's a drought, how the community depends on themselves. It, for me personally, it was very heartwarming to read, simply because I didn't realize that there were, there were still communities left like that. And the granting of the mining right caused a lot of friction in the community. Some, commu some members of the community embraced mining, uh, the, the mining active, uh, others did not. And those who resisted the granting of the mining right, the their, their, their overriding theme was, we are going to be scattered all over the place. We are going to be displaced. We, are, we will no longer be able to worship our ancestors. We will no longer be able to use the grazing fields because it would be polluted. We would no longer be able to use the water because the mines use a lot of water. So that context was very informative to me and it formed the basis of what I had to take into account. And, it, and they're not the only community. The one report that I read um, referred to many other communities that are in the same position. And it is important for all of us, and especially for the judiciary, to take cognizance of this marginalization, to take cognizance of the, all, the, the absolute importance of practicing your traditions and your customary law. One cannot disregard that. That's, that, is part, that is part of who we are as South Africans. Just for the record, I come from Daung, which 
is a, um, one of the communities which has been calling for a relook at the MPRD, precisely because of these reasons. But also, um, would you suggest perhaps that when the relook at the MPRD, because that, that act is now um, up for reviewal, um, that in fact there should be better consultation with these communities uh, and not just with the traditional leaders when permissions are sought and given? Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit in a difficult position answering your question very specifically, mm -hmm. simply because I'm mindful that there is, there is such a thing as a separation of powers. As a judge, I should be careful not to encroach upon the, uh, upon the discretion of the legislature. However, having said that, my, at, at issue in my judgment was the interaction between an act which provides for consultation and the interaction of an act that, uh, that, that, that allows or requires consent. What I did take into consideration in that specific community, um, consent had to be acquired from not only the chiefs, but mm -hmm. from the entire community. But that was part of the, of the traditional customary law that was practiced in that community. I cannot say it's the same in all communities, but in that community, Everyone had to take place. It was not a simple, simple majority. So I can only go as far as to say that we have to be sensitive. These issues, these issues are there. The marginalization is there. We know that very often mining communities, when there are mining activities, they are excluded. That is not an indictment to the legislation. That is just a fact that I gained, gained from, the, from, from the legislation. So. So obviously the, the legislature has, has the right to decide how they want to formulate legislation. But of course, as a humanist, my suggestion would be to always take into account what are you dealing with? Who are you dealing with? What is the impact of the legislation? What do you consider to be the biggest obstacles of justice in South Africa? Probably the the inequalities that still exist. I remember in 1994 when I stood in the line with, with my fellow South Africans, hoping or looking forward to casting my vote. I was, th there was a kind of euphoria at that stage. We all had hope that we are now going to eradicate economic and social inequality in this country. We are going to address the land issue. We're going to address the, the position of women in society. Unfortunately, almost 25 years down the line, I am worried that we haven't attained the necessary, inequ the necessary equality that I would have seen. There is still rife economic equality between, between South Africans. There's still equality in the workplace. The other day someone said to me, why do you refer to, the, to a glass ceiling? It's actually a concrete ce ceiling. But that's maybe another discussion. So I think the inequalities that still exist in our society is the greatest, is, is the greatest obstacle. The economic situation, unfortunately, as it is today, it's worldwide. It's a, it, there's, a, there's a problem. The e economies suffer. That is slowing down the process. And, it, and, and I, I accept that. But I think the equalities need to be addressed. And I do think the land issue also needs to be addressed. Because without, because without that, we are no, never going to have equality and a healing process in our country. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Mbofu? Yeah, look, uh, let me put it directly. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I, I agree that your judgment on Kolobini was quite bold and uh, innovative. But the question that I really, uh, Section 9 and Section 25, of the constitution cannot belong to the same constitution. In other words, the historical inequalities yes. of colonialism and uh, apartheid without uh, addressing the land question. So in other words, if you have those two sections, the one, will, one, uh, one of them it, it will be meaningless. 
What, what, what do you I agree to? with you. I can't agree with you more. One has to remember that Section 9 of the Constitution, it, it's, 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 a, it's a wide definition. It, it grants formal equality, but it also makes provision for substantive equality, in other words, equality in outcome. And equality is one of the found, founding values of our Constitution, so we have to strive in achieving equality in our, in our country. What I agree with you is that one of the reasons why we are so unequal is because of the inequality in land ownership. And I agree with you that we will never be able to achieve actual substantive equality if we do not address the land, is uh, 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 the land issue. The legislature must deal with that. It's not for our judges to deal with that. Yeah. But I do believe that that has to be addressed. And I also do believe that we will never be able to heal, heal the wounds that are still there. And, 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 and I thought after 25 years we would, have been, we would have been further in healing those wounds. I don't think we are. Unfortunately, I think those wounds are still very raw. Thank you. And we have to address substantive equality. And it's not only the land issue. It's substantive equality in all spheres, in the workplace, in society. We all know that women still haven't taken the rightful position in the, in, 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 in the workplace. So, so equality is a foundational value. We haven't reached that stage where we can say, and also, once we've reached equality, we will restore the dignity, Absolutely. which is also a foundational value of our constitution. Thank you. Okay. My last question, what's your view about uh, a politician that will write an article criticizing a judge? I have absolutely no problem with that. We are, as officers of the court, we serve the constitution, but we also serve the public. We have a civic duty towards the public. And if the public wants to criticize us, they can do so. And they can even go as far as to lay a complaint against us with the Judicial Services Commission. So I have, I have been criticized in the press. I can remember when I was at, at, at the labor court, I took a few very unpopular decisions. I'm fine with that. As long as I can live with my conscience that I have, that I've done my best and that I have, I have given a judgment that I can live with, I'm fine if there is criticism. I have no problem with that. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, if I may comment, I think your nomination illustrates the wonderful diversity of our country. So, thank you. Thank you. The second point I'd like to make, and just refer you to your case in Baleni. Um, on the last page, or the second last page of your judgment, you say the NPRDA and EPORA must be read together. Now, I just would like to know how you got to that statement, because consensus is the terminology used in the NPRDA. Correct. The EPORA provides for the informal rights of landholders or Correct. land occupiers. So there seems, and uh, it refers directly or specifically to con uh, consent. Correct. Now. I'm not sure how you, how, you, how, you, how you get to the statement that it should be read together because either consensus or consent. I don't disagree with your finding. In fact, it should be supported and it should be read wider than just a polar. In fact, consent, in my view, should be required of all mining rights or mining permit applications because that's where the value of the holder of the land or the holder of a particular right to land is then realized. But can I just ask, for my, even if it's only for my, my purpose, how do you get to the notion that it should be read together when, in my view, it is conflictory, contradictory to one another? Consensus versus consent. Yes. Can I just say, as a point of departure, that was one of the most difficult judgments I've ever read. And I must confess, Chief Justice, I did not hand down my judgment within the required three months simply because I was so conflicted when writing that judgment. However, again, one must read the two, the two acts within the context of, in which they have been enacted. It was a choice between ignoring the one and upholding the other one. That to me, after all my research, was not an option. It was my view, rightly or wrongly, that the two acts should be read together and that one cannot ignore the context and the purpose of Ipilra and the, and the reason and the purpose why it was enacted in the first place. 
So that's simply why I was informed that the two, judge, that the two acts should be read together. Um, my reasoning is there. It's much, it's much more complex than I've just now explained. But my reasoning was that there is sufficient grounds to inform me that the two acts should be read together. In the beginning, um, in the Baleni and others versus the Minister of Mineral Resources, you state that granting a mining right constitute a deprivation of section two, subsection one of a PILRA. Correct. If you can just expatiate a little bit on that. Yes, I had to decide whether or not granting a mining right constitutes expropriation vis-a-vis -vis deprivation. Now there is case law that, that informs that granting a mining right is not expropriation, it is deprivation. Because in the end, what does a mining right do? And if I can use the context of this particular case, the, the Tolobeni community informed me very passionately that by granting the mining right, the land is going to be destroyed. Now that constitutes a deprivation. And it's, excuse me, it was on that basis that I agreed with the case law, which also held that the granting of a mining right is a deprivation and not an expropriation. Of course, expropriation is, grant, is, is dealt with very differently in our law, for example, the Expropriation Act. So I was quite comfortable with that characterization of deprivation vis-a-vis -vis expropriation. Um, mine is not so much on the substance of your judgments. It's about the style in which you write your judgments. I read two of your judgments, and if you look at the Baleni, with the Baleni matter, you, you, you start with the introduction and then you go to the background and so on. Immediately thereafter, before dealing with the issue, or rather you also raise the issues, but immediately thereafter you go to your conclusion without dealing with the issues that lead to that conclusion. If you see on paragraph, um, Paragraph 31, that is after you've dealt with the order sought and so on, you come to the conclusion. Thereafter, now you deal with the law and all the other issues. I have written hundreds of judgments over the years, and I think more than 100 of my judgments have been reported. It depends on the subject matters. S sometimes and really, unfortunately, you have um, highlighted two of, or two of the judgments where that really happens, where I decide... This is my conclusion. Now I'm going to justify my conclusion. But very often I do, uh, I do agree with you. The, the normal style and the normal style that I do follow is start with the parties, start with the facts, start with what are the legal issues, start with the law, and then draw your legal conclusion. That's the normal way in which you write a judgment. But very often the context requires a deviation therefrom. In the Baleni case especially, for me, that was an issue was to restate, this is, this is my conclusion, and this is how I justify my conclusion. Now, I'm going to put questions to you which may not be put to other candidates. <clears throat> and I put them to you because of your PC background. <laughs> there must have been issues of concern to the nation that must have consumed you, preoccupied you, as a PAC activist and, there, and, 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 and a vision, a passion, personal vision in relation to what is it you're going to do as a lawyer, academic, to address those challenges. The Constitution you interpret at least according to my understanding, must be informed by the need you appreciate fully yes. to have the country change from its dark past to a brighter tomorrow. Correct. And your ability to do so is often informed by 
the practical steps you have taken ever since you appreciated the need? In, um, in 1983, I think it was 83, 84, Helen Seussman of the PF, the, PF, the PFP, I almost said EFF, the PF, uh, the, uh, the PFP visited um, the University of Pretoria. I can remember it as yes, because that is when my political awakening started. She said, this small woman came into the room, it was very hostile, and she said to us, look around you, why are you only white students? And one would ask, why didn't you realize that earlier? I can say to you, well, that was the early 80s, we didn't have social media, et cetera, et cetera, but that's no excuse. But that is when I realized, when she posed the question, I realized something was seriously wrong in this country. And it, not long after that, I visited the United States with my husband. We were, the, the reception was extremely hostile. It was at the height of the apartheid, uh, apartheid era. And I remember one meeting in, in, in New York. It was particularly hostile. The person asked me, why are there, there so many political pres prisoners, children, in your prisons? And I said to you, I, I'm sorry, I'm ashamed. I didn't know that. And then the discussion started. They gave me literature which we smuggled into South Africa. With the help of the then American embassy, we smuggled in a lot of literature. And that informed my political conscience, if I can put it that way. Other things have informed my religious conscience, but this informed my political conscience, and I realized there is something seriously wrong in this country. Now, I come from a privileged background. There's no way of sugarcoating it. What can I do to make a difference in the lives of those that I can see suffering? And it was through my action, with my interaction with, with, with other PAC members, attending many, as I've indicated, many meetings were held in my house. Through the interaction, one thing, and it's a sideline, one thing that I can say, as a white person coming from a privileged background, I was 100% embraced, 100% part of part of the group. There was no prejudice against me. There was no, uh, um, uh, in, in the sense that taking into account my background that I come from. And it was then when I uh, started my programs at UNISA, I have education. I have been privileged with education and it's my duty as a citizen, it's my duty as an academic, it's my duty as a fellow South African to transfer the knowledge that I have to those who haven't been able to attend university or even a proper school in a similar position as I have been. And that is where I believe I made a, a little bit of contribution by addressing people, by networking, by going to church groups. As a matter of fact, at one stage we um, um, joined a church group. I don't you might recall Duomini Niku Smith who lived in, 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 in Mama Lodi. He was a white Duomini in those years who had the guts to go and live in Mama Lodi so that he can be with his flock. I admire that greatly simply because I didn't have the guts to do that. But all of that informed me that each of us can make a small difference. And through my interaction with women groups, church groups, and... Uh, and um, I try to transfer knowledge, I try to make the law more accessible, to educate those who have not been educated, that you have certain rights and that you can pursue your rights through the, through the court systems. So more than that, I cannot, I, I cannot say more than that. It, it, it was, I answered to my conscience and I try to do something in order to do something for my fellow South African in those. Now, my last question, I think it is, um, you know, when you go to countries like China, Cuba, and wherever else, people actually apply, or even Japan, they apply their original law in their, in their, in their system. They've adapted it to, to the times. Is it your sense that African traditional law or African customary law is given the the space, the respect that it deserves in the development of our law, our jurisprudence, that is 
equal to. The common law that doesn't even uh, originate from this continent, originates elsewhere. Or is there more preference and more protection for the common law than there is for African customary law? And I'm asking you because you are an Africanist. I agree with you that customary law has not been granted the position that it sh or, or, or the status that it should have been given. And I think that also um, um, emerges from what I've said in the Baleni case, where I said that customary law is a law of equal status and it should be given its due recognition. I'm not sure whether it is because of our common law history that there has been a resistance to developing customary law as it should have been developed. I know that certainly the Constitution contains a, 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 an imperative that customary law should be encouraged and the development of customary law should be developed. Um, my sense is that, and, and, and I'm aware of the fact that there is a traditional courts bill currently in, in, in progress, and I think we do not know how it ultimately it's going to look, but that court system, I believe, will ultimately go a long way in developing Africanism and, and, and customary law as a full-fledged partner of the rest of our jurisprudence. Thank you, Judge Basson. You're excused. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioners, for your time.